Hello students, welcome to this lesson on voltaic cells. So the first thing we have to do is understand this term electrochemical cells, which are really devices that deal with electricity and chemicals at the same time. There are two types of electrochemical cells, voltaic cells, electrolytic. This lesson is about voltaic. Prior knowledge. What do we know happens when copper two ions come into contact with zinc metal? Well, there's my copper two ions, there's a strip of zinc, and here's what we know. We know from our chart of reduction half reactions that copper two ions react spontaneously with zinc. So the strongest oxidizing agent is copper two. It gets reduced, which means it gains electrons. And the strongest reducing agent is oxidized, which means that loses electrons. So essentially what happens is when copper two comes in contact with a zinc strip, electrons are attracted from the zinc over to the copper two. So we know electrons want to move to copper two. The flow of electrons is called electricity. So can we harness the electricity somehow? Well, what if we were to separate the zinc from the copper two. What if we did this? What if we move the zinc outside the beaker? Now we want to create the flow of electrons. How would we get the electrons to flow to copper two? They don't do us much good when it's inside the beaker, but if we can get electrons to flow a distance, we can put a device in between the flow and create electricity, which will power some device that we want. So how can we get those electrons to move to the copper two? What about wire? What if we attached a wire? Now electrons will move and we could get them to do some work for us. So that's the basic idea. Now there's some details we're gonna to need to understand a little further. Here's what the device looks like when it's finished. There's another beaker, a strip of copper metal, uh, what we call a U-shaped tube or a U-tube, and that is a voltaic cell. Now, a voltaic cell is essentially what you think of as a battery. And here's how a battery basically works. When arranged a certain way, chemicals, in this case, copper two and zinc, create electricity. And we can get that electricity to do some work for us, like power our cell phone. So a voltaic cell has three characteristics. Chemicals are used to create electricity. They have spontaneous reactions. They just occur when they come into contact and they have positive voltages. They have five constants, and we'll talk about them later. We all know the acronym already, Leo the Lion says GER. Well, I've changed it a little bit for this lesson. Uh, Leo Anderson is a bit of a jerk. Now, we'll talk about that later. Now, anybody who's related to somebody who's named Leo Anderson, this is purely coincidental. I don't know a Leo Anderson. It's just an easy acronym. Um, so we're going to talk about all of those characteristics um, as we go. So voltaic cell. There's our three characteristics. We already know the chemicals will generate electricity. And there are our five constants. Okay, that is called cell notation. And in cell notation, we have a half reaction or a half cell. And on the other side, we have the other half cell. So let's look at the first half cell. The copper is the electrode. That's a chunk of copper metal, and we call it an electrode. Copper two is the solution that that electrode sits in. We call it the electrolyte. Now copper two ions are actually a blue color, and that's why the beaker is shaded blue. We have this line here. I think of it this way. The copper electrode sits in the copper two electrolyte solution. All right, we also have a negative ion in the beaker, sulfate, uh, but because it's a spectator, we don't usually write that down in the cell notation. And of course, we have an aqueous symbol, which means water is present. We don't usually write that down either. So we have these double lines. That indicates a boundary of some kind. It's either a salt bridge or a porous cup. In this case, it's a salt bridge, which is a U-shaped tube that's filled with a salt, like sodium chloride. Um, we, on the other side, we have our zinc solution, 
our zinc electrode, uh, we have a, 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 an ammeter which measures current, the flow of electrons. We have in my course, it's called an external circuit. That's what the curriculum requires, that word. Uh, most of us think of it as wire. <laughs> and we also have um, some cotton plugs in the salt bridge to hold the solution in place. Okay, so that is the construction of a voltaic cell. Now let's look at the reactions. We know this already, but let's review it again. The strongest oxidizing agent on our chart in this cell is copper 2 positive. It gets reduced, and I have the acronym GERK, or JERK. Gain of electrons is reduction and occurs at the cathode. I'll explain more as I go, but here's my reduction half reaction. That's what it shows me on the table. Copper 2 plus 2 electrons forms copper solid. And now we're going to look at these voltages. Attached to each half reaction is a voltage. We call it the cell potential. It's the potential voltage associated with this half reaction. You'll see how that works in just a moment as well. So let's look at the strongest reducing agent, which gets oxidized. Zinc gets oxidized, which means it's the loss of electrons, which is oxidation, and that occurs at what we call the anode. I'll get to the anode part in a sec. So there's the reaction that's copied right out of our, our booklet, our, our reduction half reaction table. Zinc 2 plus 2 electrons makes zinc. There's the voltage associated with it. Notice it's a negative 0.76. And the oxidizing agent, copper 2, reacts spontaneously with zinc, the reducing agent. And that's why the second characteristic is a spontaneous reaction. Now, we've got a little bit of a problem. We require an oxidation half reaction here. But as you can see, the electrons are on the reactant side. That's a reduction equation. And that won't do. So we have to flip it, as you know. We flip the reaction. And now we have our oxidation reaction. If I flip the reaction, I gotta flip the negative to a positive. So I'm gonna do that. And now I can balance my equation. The electrons are already balanced, so I will just cancel those out. Now, if I did have to multiply a reaction to balance the electrons, I would not multiply the voltage. So let's say I had silver gaining one electron, and copper throwing away two electrons, those aren't balanced. So I would multiply the silver ion reaction by two, and you would think I would multiply its voltage by two, but I don't. Never multiply the voltages. All right, so there's my reaction. Copper two plus zinc makes copper and zinc two, and when I add my voltages together, I get 1.10 volts. And you'll notice it's a positive voltage. Batteries, we want to produce electricity, which makes sense. They're always going to be positive voltages. All right, moving on. Let's look at our Leo the Lion Says GER acronym. Now, you all know Leo the Lion Says GER, loss of electrons oxidation, gain of electrons reduction. Leo has a cousin, his name's Leo Anderson, and unfortunately, old Leo's a bit of a jerk. So some people just are, right? Well, let's take a look at what this means. Loss of electron oxidation occurs at the anode, which means, in this case, zinc is the anode. The anode in a, in a battery is the negative post. All right, and that means the oxidation half reaction is the anode reaction. Okay. All right, let's look at the next one. Jerk or gurk. <laughs> All right, so gain of electrons reduction occurs at the cathode. Now be careful with this one. Copper 2 is the strongest oxidizing agent and does gain the electrons, but the electrolyte is not the electrode. So the ion is not the electrode. The cathode is the electrode that makes contact with the SOA. So Cu2 positive is the SOA, but the electrode is actually the copper solid. Now we'll learn a little bit more about that when we get into the flow of the electrons here.
The cathode is the positive post on what we all think of as a battery. And the reduction half reaction is the cathode half reaction. All right, so that's our Leo Anderson's a bit of a jerk. Okay, next. We know that the zinc is separated from the copper too, like we learned at the beginning of this lesson. And we know where the electrons are going to go. On what path will the electrons travel to get to the copper two ion? Well, pretty simple. The electrons will move that way. They will move from the anode to the cathode. Electrons always move from the negative post, the anode, to the positive post, the cathode. As that happens, we can put a meter on here, an ammeter, which will measure the current or the flow of electrons. So we would see the needle move in our ammeter, proving that electrons are flowing. Now, electrons do not do that. Electrons do not travel through the solutions. Okay, think of electrons like cars and ions like fish. Okay, so why do I say that? Cars travel on land or on highways. Fish travel in the water. So think of it like this. If that car wanted to get over to the copper two ion, would it jump into the water? Uh, probably not. It would sink. So electrons are sort of like cars. They like solid pathways. They like roads, electron roads. The electrode is connected to the wire and it's all solid pathway and electrons can flow easily. So electrons are like cars. Ions are aqueous. They live in the water. They're like fish. They like traveling in water. All right, so think of electrons like cars and ions like fish. Uh, electrons travel on solid pathways. Ions travel in solutions. All right, now let's look closer at our oxidation half reaction. Notice zinc throws away two electrons, and when it does that, it becomes zinc 2 positive aqueous. Now, if you're watching um, carefully and thinking about this, like a chemist, zinc is actually dissolving as it loses electrons. It's going from solid to aqueous. So watch the bottom of the anode. The zinc starts to dissolve and forms zinc to aqueous. All right, let's look at what's happening at the copper side of this equation. Copper to aqueous grabs two electrons and turns into copper solid. So what's happening at that electrode? Well, you'll see that the copper two ions grab electrons and form a copper solid. So the cathode increases in mass over time and the anode decreases in mass over time. Okay, note, when electrons arrive, they do not jump into the water and swim to Cu2 positive. Okay, electrons are transferred to copper two when they come into contact with each other on the surface of the cathode. So if you watch closely again, the electrons arrive, they don't jump into the water, copper two touches the surface and then the electrons um, are gained by the copper two. Okay, good, just wanna make that clear. Now let's look at the net charge in the solution. Take a look at this net charge, positive two and negative two. The net charge is zero. Now, when we lose two electrons from zinc, we form zinc two. All of a sudden, that solution has gained a charge of plus two. And now we see what our ions in the salt bridge are for. The ions are like fish, remember? They swim through solution. And so the negative ions get attracted to those positives and they get pulled down through the cotton plug. They can fit through the little holes in the cotton plug and they balance off the charge in that beaker. <clears throat> and so we learn another constant. Anions or negative ions always flow to the anode. All right, well, let's look at the other side. What's gonna happen here? The net charge again is plus two, negative two is zero. And now I gain some electrons on this side. I just lost a positive two. So now the charge is negative two in the solution. And guess what happens? 
little positive fishies swim down and balance out the charge. Hey, isn't that awesome? Okay, so um, that's what the salt bridge is for. And we learn another constant. The cations, or positive ions, always migrate to the cathode. Now, why is the salt bridge so important? Well, watch what happens. If the salt bridge is removed, then electrons actually stop flowing. And why does that happen? Well, it's because the fish stops swimming. If the ions stop flowing, everything stops. So there needs to be an electron flow and an ion flow for this to work. If the ions can't flow through the salt bridge uh, to balance the charge, the circuit is broken. Okay, so how does a how does a battery work that you know that that you go buy? You're not going to go buy <laughs> those beakers and those YouTubes and stick them in a flashlight, right? So here's here's a um, not a demonstration cell, but like something real that you would buy. When you buy a battery, there's a positive post and a negative post. And what does it look like inside? So I'm going to dissolve the, the case, cut this thing in half, and here's what it looks like inside. There's inside. The center rod is made of graphite or carbon, and that's the cathode. The outer case is made of zinc, and that's the anode. So that's kind of like our cell. The zinc was the anode. I'm going to stick a device in there, a light bulb, there's some wire, okay, and away we go. Where do electrons come from? The anode. Where do they go to? The cathode. So, there's a paste inside the, the battery, these alkaline batteries, these non-rechargeable batteries. And we have a manganese 4 oxide um, paste, and ammonium chloride's in there as well. Uh, the MnO2 is the strongest oxidizing agent, which gains the electrons, and the zinc is the strongest reducing agent, which loses the electrons. So I clean up the, the diagram, and it looks like this. My electrons leave my anode, the case. They go do their work, and they get grabbed by MnO2. There it is. There's your battery. Chemicals make electricity. There's an alternative construction for this cell. I talked earlier about my YouTube, the salt bridge. We could also use what we call a porous cup. And that simplifies this a little bit. We don't need two beakers, we can use one. So here's how this looks. We get rid of a beaker, we bring in this porous cup, which is made out of a ceramic material, and we fill it with zinc-2 solution, just like in our other cell. And I put it over there, and I move my zinc into place, and there we go. Now, how does this work? Well, it everything is the same. The three characteristics are the same. The chemicals make electricity. It's spontaneous, positive voltage. My constants are the same. The anode is still zinc. The cathode is still copper. My electrons still flow from anode to cathode. The anode dissolves over time and gets um, decreases in mass. The cathode increases in mass. And now I need ions to flow. Now let's talk about this porous cup. The porous cup has tiny holes, or pores, which allow ions to pass through. Water mo molecules are too large to go through, but ions can go through. So here's what happens. Anything that's an anion, a negative ion, actually goes through the wall of the porous cup towards the anode. And it looks like this. The anions go right into the towards the anode through the cup. And the cations do the same thing. Cations migrate towards the cathode. Any, anything positive migrates that way. And there you have it, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, the voltaic cell.